The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Let me share my screen. Okay, I think we got everything here. Necessity of revenge done on St. Patrick's Day, which makes sense because the Irish perfected revenge. Uh, how to achieve rehumanization through revenge. Now these two concepts, everybody always has this, a loaded word and I like to tackle loaded words and, and words that are uh, already assumed to be well-defined. And so I'll be doing this once again with the concept of revenge. And to do so, we got to start at the beginning. We always start at the beginning. We start at how these words are defined. Now, most people think revenge is just to take revenge, to take revenge, and there's more to it, and punishment, and all these dark things. There's actually a little bit more to it. Uh, we go from revenge to, obviously, venge, or vingir. I think that's how you pronounce that, which means, again, more punishment stuff. Uh, then we get the vindication, because uh, it comes from vindicate, to not just avenge, but to vindicate, meaning to prove true, which is interesting. Um, and then from vindicate, we get vindicare, which is Latin to Vindicto, I don't think I'm pronouncing that correct, which leads us to, to devote protection. That's interesting. Revenge is this bad thing, right? But to devote protection, how can that possibly be bad? Well, it can be, but it's also essential. And so while we're on the topic of words, let's see how often the word revenge shows up over the last 200 years, according to our wonderful tool, um, Engram and, and uh, Google we see an interesting decline in the usage of revenge, wrath, and vengeance around the time that socialism starts making the rounds. So you have Karl Marx born around here. You have a lot of European wars that are going on here. And then just uh, this concept, it kind of goes real quiet for a little bit. It gets a nice little bump in the 60s because of Vietnam. And then it's on its way back up. There's a trend going on here. There is a demand for revenge happening around this period. This is also the time in which we decoupled from the gold standard and people aren't liking that arrangement. So the word starts cropping up after a while. Now, how did this slump down, right? How did these words frequency slump down between all the magazines and books and everything that happened? Well, it didn't necessarily disappear. It's not like people forgot what revenge was. They just camouflaged the word they used for it. So instead of using revenge, they used the word equality instead and notice that ticks up as soon as this starts ticking down. But this doesn't take the cake anywhere near as much as the word balance. Balance, on the other hand, is the de facto standard for revenge. And it takes a big swift rise over time. And that's actually on its way down here. I suspect uh, there is some nuance regarding balance dropping uh, here because it's no longer being used to describe things like economics. because <laughs> There is no balance, right? So um, these uh, balance becomes the surrogate for revenge. In a, in a linguistic frequency manner, I propose at least. So since we're talking about the definitions of revenge, it would actually be in our best interest to define who shouldn't be qualified to define revenge. And this sounds strange because I'm going to make the case that revenge is a human emotion that everybody has it. Well, not an emotion, but it's certainly a, uh, a behavioral outcome, a most likely behavioral outcome. Um, and I'm going to then say that, by the way, while you feel this thing, you also shouldn't be allowed to define it. So kind of bear with my strange juxtaposition here. And I like to pick on the favorite thing that I always like to pick on. You may think it's one thing, but it's actually American consumers. Ha! So uh, American consumers, they have this very limited interface with the concept of vengeance. So they don't actually know what revenge is. It's the saddest thing in the world, a population of people who have never once in their life experienced revenge. In fact, all they're giving is a bunch of given is a bunch of uh, simulations of revenge. You know, you get karma, which I like to define revenge for lazy people. Just wait patiently for the failure of the system. I mean, great, okay, anybody can do that. That's easy to onboard to. Geez, make it any easier, right? Then we get to astrology. You know, gravitational displacement is on my side somehow, right? The the the, the motion of mass bodies are are gonna you know bring wrath to my foes if I, I don't know, if I look at the stars hard enough. And then it, it, you get divine wrath. You know, you know I, I prayed to this God for as long, you know, he owes me. I'm on, I'm on his good side. He's going he's gonna to come down on my behalf eventually, right? And then social media where 
petty squabbles can explode and you can just throw the whole blame on someone else. So these aren't revenge. None of these are revenge. These are actually manifestations of what we assume to be revenge and what we tend to ascribe to revenge, but it's not necessarily revenge. These are just mediums of expression and they're all intentionally uh, muted, they're actually useless. But we don't stop there. There's a bunch more Hollywood gets in on the party. Why would you get revenge when you can watch other people do it? So now you can live, uh, you can live through other people instead. And that brings the demand for revenge down. Moral snobbery, you know? I don't have to do that. I don't have to get my hands dirty. I have the browns for that. You know, you, you'll hear that in certain circles. And then neurotic paralysis. Let's say none of this stuff is working on you and you actually want to get revenge, but now you're thinking like chess. You're thinking moves. You're like, oh, I got to move here, but if I do this, I'm going to do this. And go Disney. And then you're not getting revenge. You're too busy thinking of the first move. You never even make the first move. And then America's favorite game, ideology mercantilism. The cause I believe in is revenge because I have more votes than you, duh. So if I, if, I, if I got all the votes, then I have more revenge uh, potential than you do. And that's, that's, my, that's ideological mercantilism, which we call politics. So all of these things are designed to take the concept of revenge and either humiliate it, make it useless, defang it, uh, remove its entire benefit, uh, and then channel all of the things that used to be revenge into a broken judicial system. So this, this is all by design. These are... These are Absolutely, intentionally, the, these, these types of manifestations, they are picked for their weakness on purpose. And the American consumer is just knee deep in these constructs, which is why they are not qualified to define revenge. They're qualified to feel it. They wouldn't even know how to act on it. So if we're looking at definitions of revenge, we may have to step backwards. We may have to look a little bit through history to get what it is we're so hung up on running away from, because let's be honest, we are trying to run away from revenge. We're trying to make the world a better place. We're trying to make the world more peaceful. Uh, all these things, it, we're running from revenge, effectively. Uh, we're running from the, uh, the outcomes of our previous actions. So it makes sense to go back into history and figure out revenge. It's a funny thing about uh, Julius Caesar. He just crucified all the people who held him for ransom. That's pretty much revenge, right? There's a pretty good definition of revenge. One of the frequent things about revenge is that it tends to get banned when force is used to grab power. So if we look at China, uh, Japan during the, the Meiji Restoration, you'll see after prolonged periods of war, I think for close to 200 years with various daimyos and, and shoguns, um, the Americans decide to say, well, that's enough. It's time to open up the country. And if you've never seen Bill Wirtz's uh, video on Japan, History of Japan, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, so Japan rolls in and says, you're going to trade uh, a, or we're just going to keep shooting you. And the, the Japanese kind of uh, appease the situation because they know they're superiorly outnumbered and, and trade wise outnumbered. And one of the things they start doing is to make sure that the trade is productive, they begin to outlaw what is known as uh, karakuchi. I'm not Japanese. I'm not even going to pretend. Um, which is basically, it's blood revenge for you're avenging the murder of your father or your elder brother. And Japan was rife with this, like literally rife. But it was typically reserved for samurai only. So it wasn't like uh, like the peasants could actually run around and do this. Although... They were armed from time to time. Actually, they were armed quite often. Um, you would have what's called sword hunts to um, whenever a daimyo or shogun rose to power, they would immediately conduct a sword hunt and extract all the weapons from all the people uh, that helped the daimyo get the power. Um, and so uh, when the Americans come in, they start, uh, the Japanese agree to start banning the samurai class and they start banning this practice of revenge. And the wording is quite interesting. While this is a natural expression of the deepest human feelings, it is ultimately a serious breach of law. Okay, hold on, wait a second, right? The way we talk about revenge in our current parlance is that we think it's a mental disorder. We think it's something you have to cure. If you take these pills, you might reduce your revenge. Oh, this is whatever, right? This is just a straight up acknowledgement that yes, we, the power in Japan, recognize that this is what humans do. They're not saying it's evil. They're not saying it's a thing that needs to be cured. 
they're saying, look, we're human. I get it. It's just against the law. You can't do that, right? That's their entire justification for banning revenge. It's like, this is just against the law. Don't do it anymore. Which is a fascinating approach. It's complete, completely opposite to what we do today. We think revenge is like this plague you have to cure, but not here. And so when you, when you take a culture who was basically at war with each other for like 300 years, and you say that your primary means of resolving your conflict is now banned, and you have to use this Western court system that you don't even understand to resolve your disputes, eh, that's not going to go well. That's really not going to go well. And uh, it didn't. It took about 70 years for the Japanese to, to lash out pretty hard at, against their uh, geopolitical rivals, which were the Americans at that time. That's all it took was 70 years. And uh, their Hawaii lust got real, it was something. Um, and then we uh, decided to roll in after nuking the hell out of them and we took all their weapons, but we left them vending machines for used panties. That's the important part. Uh, it's, it's just one of, those, one of those things. We take your weapons and then we'll humiliate you. And uh, that's what happens when you ban revenge. It doesn't really work. You just buy a little bit of time. So this is an example of, of revenge following the trend of being banned only when force is used to grab power for, for obvious reasons. If I can use force to get power, then I'm going to make sure that nobody else can do it afterwards, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward thinking. So it's not actually a moral crusade. In this case, it's not. It's not one of those things where we're curing or whatever. It's actually just a pragmatic power uh, action. So then we get to uh, other cultures who engaged in the practice of what I'm going to call revenge rituals. Now, in America, we like to hold Native American mythology and the way we talk about Native Americans in this like sacrosanct, unassailable, perfect column where they've never done wrong any time ever. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's a good way to kind of take their culture in the context in which they did it. It's a bit, you know, condescending, in my opinion, because... <laughs> Native American revenge rituals were brutal. They were unforgiving. Uh, if you were, if you were, if it was manslaughter or if it was uh, premeditated homicide, there was no distinction. You were completely up for, for blood revenge. If you accidentally killed someone, sorry, pal, that's the law. So this is, this is pretty heartless stuff. Um, and uh, this extends to... Every tribe is different, obviously. You can't actually paint this brush and say, well, the Navajo did this and the Apache did this. You know, it's, I mean, you get to the Incans and their concept of revenge was insane. So, so there's, there's obviously variations here, but they are human like the rest of us. And yeah, they're doing revenge rituals like the rest of us. Let's, let's call things what they are. And then you, when, you, when you review this text, you always have, like, this is some, like, weird, like, some scholars, you know, citation required. Some scholars suggest that it wasn't as bad as it was, and don't freak out if it was. It's like, you know, you, you always have to keep that in mind when dealing with this text. I'm just pointing that out so you know. Um, but they were doing blood revenge. Let's, you know, let's be honest. And it wasn't just uh, Native Americans on the American continent that were engaging revenge. It was also the colonists. The settlers were coming in. Uh, they were definitely doing revenge. In the case of, of, um, of Hannah Dustin, uh, Hannah Dustin was kidnapped by some, uh, I forget which particular tribe, um, and she escaped by basically butchering everyone, including six children, to get out of there. And uh, nobody believed that she had done this, and so she went back and scalped all the corpses, including the children. And she's the first American woman to be honored with a statue because of this. So the first woman who has a statue in America is done so because of an act of revenge. So we did it, ladies. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting, right? This revenge stuff, it's, it seems to be universal and it seems to be culturally appreciated. I mean, you know, what's, that, is, that is an interesting thing that it's actually celebrated. It's, it's not taboo. You know, we saw what the Japanese uh, response to that was. They said, wow, this is the deepest expression of human emotion. And we're throwing statues for people who scalp children, right? So this revenge thing is, is pretty ubiquitous. Sorry, moving to the next one. And, and don't think that Immanuel Kant is out there. You know, he's not, he's not immune to this either. I mean, let's, let's look at his scenario, right? He's describing that if a civil society was to dissolve itself of all of its members and just leave an island, 
the last murderers lying in prison ought to be executed before their resolution was carried out. So, so this is equivalent to turning into judge fucking dread when the nukes have already landed and just running from prison cell to prison cell, executing every single prisoner before you leave. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is nuts, right? <laughs> but this is Immanuel Kant. And even, even you know, the, the grand uh, meta metaphysics and, and moral ethicists ethicist and, and critique of pure reason, even he's out here just straight butchering people. So, so this is this is not this is not a taboo thing. Um, this need, this necessity for revenge, is universal, regardless of culture, regardless of time, uh, gender, regardless of anything. And are everyone's favorite, you know, the Buddhists, these peaceful people? That's just not true. Uh, when when um. Excuse me, when, when the Tamil king was slain by uh, a Sri Lankan king, he immediately went to some of the priests there and said, what is my negative karma for this fight? And the priests came up with this ridiculous rationale saying that only one and a half per people died. I think he butchered close to like 600 people. No, they only know about one and a half. And the rationale... <laughs> it's just like uh, one of them uh, had, had taken the five precepts. Uh, and then another one kind of got it there, and the rest weren't people, so no negative deaths, right? And, be, and before you say, well, that's just, you know, I'm, I'm cherry-picking history here. Well, you know, let's just look at this particular tradition, which basically says at the end of time in the future, the great Buddhist army is going to sweep down from the Himalayas for revenge against someone named Muhammad. Oh, that's something you can't really talk about that. But but again, this revenge stuff, even the most peaceful people that is that you can conceive of. Um, I started with the Japanese who are notoriously warlike. I moved the Native Americans and they're, you know, they're not really known for being warlike. I'm with the Buddhists, right? They're just sitting there. They're praying. How could they be warlike? Everybody's doing revenge, right? Everybody's doing it historically. There's just no, no way out of this. So let's. So now we got a basis of history of, of, of people doing this stuff. It, it bears importance to explain why they're doing this stuff. Why are people doing these? Re, re, why are they revenging so hard? Right? How are they? How do they all hate each other all the time? Um, and there are layers of very bad neuromythologies about that too. Um, eye for an eye is one of those concepts that tends to get totally taken out of context. Uh, regardless of when that phrase even came around. And everyone's, the, the one phrase that people tend to know is straight from the Bible, um, you know, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Well, okay, that's a nice quip, but have you read the whole passage? It, it's good to take things in the context in which they're written. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Okay, that's pretty peaceful. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Sure, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. What? Wait, what? <laughs> so, so this is. It, it, I'm ready to admit that that this is a a uh, a uh, an analog or a metaphor, right? This is a metaphor. Um, they're not actually putting burning coals on someone's head and torturing them that way. It, this is kind of alluding to possibly, and there's a lot of discussion about what this phrase means, but um, possibly inducing shame in the person because you're being so kind. That may be the intention behind that speech, but more importantly is what happens after it. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now compare that sentence, that last that box right here with the consumer experience of revenge, where it's just sit down, shut up, don't do anything. Here's some dumb interpretations of revenge. This passage is saying you overcome evil with good. It doesn't say sit there and take it. It doesn't say turn the other cheek. It doesn't say uh, it's a passive thing that's going to resolve itself if you just do nothing. It is on you to overcome it, right? It is an action. So vengeance may be the Lord's, but you still have to overcome evil on your own. And that, gets, that tends to get thrown out with the, with the bathwater. So that's one of these, these bad neuromythologies that is taken out of context all the time regarding revenge. And then one of, the, one of the things I like to focus on is the just world hypothesis, which is pretty freaking common. Uh, that's why I picked this one so much. It's a cognitive bias, which automatically includes it as a neuromythology. Um, it's the idea that uh, good people are eventually rewarded and evil people are eventually punished. Now, this seems like a pretty good uh, 
this seems like a rather intuitive um, collection of descriptions or predictors about revenge. Sure, uh, it may be. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of problems with this. For example, when, when the just world hypothesis was kind of framed as a cognitive bias, they, they did so to make it sound anti-science, to make just world sound like it's anti-science. And so as a result, um, the conclusions that just world hypothesis was alluding to could then be challenged. Uh, but I think, I think there's a lot that's being lost in this desire to eliminate revenge by eliminate a common bias. I don't think that gets the job done. I don't even think it helps, to be honest. Um, you know, because these are, these, the, it's, a, it's a fundamental fallacy of assuming like karma that, you know, sit down and, and, the, and, the, and the heavens will be in your favor, uh, rationalizing people's suffering on the grounds they deserve it, right? That appears heartless to most people, um, which of course, is, is equivalent to saying, you know, if you have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide. This is what, that's the, that's the ultimate manifestation of the just world hypothesis right there. And if, if Goebbels is a bit of a, is a, is a bit of a hack on my part, let's just hear, you know, Dr. Phil say it. So let's, uh, let's look into some of the early evidence of, of just world bias driving revenge impulses. And more importantly, it's the violation of just world, this commonly held neuromythology, it's the violation of that mythology that's assumed to cause revenge. So another one of these shock experiments that you see throughout the 70s and uh, 60s and 70s, it's where um, initially these observing participants were upset by the victim being uh, uh, suffering, uh, victim suffering. So they're getting electric shock, but as the suffering continued, the observers remain unable to intervene. The observers began to reject and devalue the victim. So if I'm kicking the shit out of somebody and that person does not lift up uh, the, the will to fight back, then we will actually start to devalue the victim, the person who's having the shit kicked out of them. Now that's interesting because you'd think according to all the, all the fun stuff that we know about moral supremacy and, and how right we are all the time, you would think that we would always intervene and we would always help, but that's not true. Not everyone's a fucking hero. They'll just sit there and they will fall into the state and say, well, that person deserved it, man. That's just world. And the, the rejection and devaluation of the victim was greater when the observed suffering was greater. So the more, the worse he had the shit kicked out of him, the worse I actually devalued this person. Now that's that's kind of weird. Now, there's a, there's a, but it makes sense in a weird way. So there's actually some. Uh, just to, you know, let me give some practical examples of like walking past the bum. You give money to a bum, and every time you give him money, he's still a bum. Guess what you're going to do? You're not going to keep your, your, your altruistic revenge impulse decreases because you know it's not going to help. It's no fault of your own. It's just your own neurochemistry. Meanwhile, if the suffering has a fixed end or there's conditional off-ramps, endurance is seen as revenge. So if I know that the, the suffering has an actual fixed moment of completion, um, surviving it is actually seen as an act of defiance. But these are all the, the variations of, of human adaptivity in this space of, 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 their, of their assessment of social order and getting back at people, right? It's, it's not as clear cut as you think. And we, and we get further and further along. And then there's some stuff that's completely just like uh, uh, the opposite of intuition. So looking into some more of the uh, alternative explanations of what's happening with the just world, uh, the violations of the just world, were there scenarios where a person who allows themselves to be shocked in the experiment is devalued? It's not the fact that, they've, that they're suffering or they've experienced a lot of suffering. It's the idea that how dare that person allow themselves to even fall into that obvious trap? What a cuck, right? And that's kind of, that's, that's a thing, you know, that's an alternative explanation. Then there's another one about guilt. The idea that when the just world is violated, when the idea of a just world is violated, um, the victims reduce their, uh, those who then look down on the victims have an incentive to reduce their feelings of guilt. And that's, uh, again, these are all the, the, the ways that revenge is not just this isolated thing. It involves every aspect of the human cognitive and emotional spectrum. It's, it's not just this like one little defect in the brain you have to cure. 
And in fact, uh, in order to reduce the guilt, they'll deval- they will devalue the victim. So they feel guilty about being in it. And so what they do is to hide the guilt. They just take it out on the victim even more. That's crazy. And then you have this situation where it's not even the, the desire to, if a violation of just world happens, it's not even the desire to restore the just world that may be driving any of this stuff. It's just that they're reducing the discomfort caused by empathizing. So they're looking at the person having the shit kicked out of them. It's making them feel bad. And so they just start, uh, they start dehumanizing the victim just to reduce their feelings of, of empathy because the empathy is helpless. They can't do anything about it. So, so all of a sudden we've taken this concept of revenge and now it's involving all these other factors that you didn't think had anything to do with revenge. So it's, it's just world. I don't think just world is, I don't think the critiques to just world are valuable here. Um, from a personal standpoint, just world is a bias that does exist. People do think that the good get rewarded and the bad eventually get punished, right? That's a common thing. Uh, but these explanations are still dancing around the topic. They're dancing around the real sources that are going on here. And it makes sense because a lot of this stuff was done in the 60s. So they didn't have like, you know, fMRIs or whatever, right? So that's fine. I you know, give them a little bit of credence here. And then we roll up to another neuromythology called Beyond Revenge by uh, Michael McCall. McCullough. Um, and this starts laying the groundwork to try to cure revenge. We're interested in curing revenge now. So the, the key challenge you're promoting forgiveness, because that it's the, curing vengeance and promoting forgiveness are, are very easily the same side of the same coin. Um, and the key challenge of promoting forgiveness involves creating the social conditions that signal and activate careworthiness, value, and safety among strangers. Okay, hold on. All right, so so we're not talking about um, revenge anymore. The moment you introduce strangers, we're not talking about revenge uh, because revenge involves revenge is more complicated than strangers versus family, and this is later categorized as in group versus out group, which I'll be getting into a couple slides later. Um, but this is this this book is coming around trying to trying to basically say how do we get strangers to play nice? And this makes sense because it's the 80s and 90s, and they're about to roll out a whole bunch of multiculturalism. So this is actually like a, a really important topic for these people because they want to make sure that if we're going to bring all these cultures together that do not get along, then how do you minimize their conflict? And that's kind of the that's kind of the impetus behind this book and when and the year it was written. So it was definitely riding the wave of that time. And so it's kind of like Promoting forgiveness is just buzzword for cure vengeance. That's the takeaway here. And then he had another book called The Kindness of Strangers, which again starts with a very flawed premise. It's saying, how did humans, a species of self-centered apes, come to care about others? One, we're not self-centered apes. That, that is a moral judgment right there. We, we, are, we are social creatures first and foremost. There are, there's infinite number of biological research behind that. So the idea of the self-centered ape is kind of, there's a lot of heavy weighting there, but more importantly, he makes the case, and this is, this, is, this is fucking amazing on his part. He makes the case that the choices to get people to play together was a moral invention, driven not by evolution's dictates, but by reason, by force of reason, by force of law, by force of morality. He's making his case in this book that we need to come down with the heavy fist of centralization to force uh, a, a cure for revenge under the name of promoting forgiveness to make sure the strangers don't you know, strangle each other all the time. And so, and so these, these books and these themes of kind of looking at revenge as a problem, as something that can affect your bottom line, well, we've seen this before in Japan. It did affect their bottom line. It affected their ability to trade. If your samurais are out there butchering each other and they're slaughtering the farmers, then how do you get your exports reliable, right? So now this is America's time to have the same exact problem. And we're gonna have the same exact solution. So we get to, you know, game theory tends to dominate a lot of models of revenge, specifically the, the prisoner's dilemma. You know, if you have a, a give for those who don't know, I'm sure you know, it's the most overtalked part of game theory. Um, prisoner A and B, whether they confess or remain silent, and it can be broken down into two categories. You have revenge equity in which both of them are spending an equal amount of time, um, either both by confessing or both remaining silent, or you have a revenge asymmetry in which one gets off and the other one gets on the hook. 
right? So what we've done is we've taken the entirety of revenge and we've boiled it down to a binary outcome. What the fuck hubris is that? You've got to be kidding me. So we take our police officer, we take our prisoners, and they're interrogating him. And we're going to get one of these confession or remain silent scenarios. You know, that's the promise here. And then we're going to go to Judge Judy and she's going to make a decision, right? So, so we're, we're, we're taking the complexity of revenge and we're framing it into a binary switch, into an on, off, yes, no, right? So we don't have to worry about all the things that are driving revenge. Not at all. No, no, no. We have to worry about the outcomes alone. And so what we've done is we've, it's the outcomes of the frame that are sold as the importance regarding game theory's models of revenge, but it's really the framing of the outcomes that provides the deterrence. Because if you know that the outcome of this game is going to be either defection or uh, a confession or remaining silent, then putting yourself in that box is what you don't want to do. So this is, the, it's the frame itself that's acting as a deterrent for revenge behavior. And this is where game theory kinds of, this is the power behind the game theory's dominance of revenge models. It's, it's the framing of the outcomes that serves as the deterrent, not the actual outcomes of the frame. All right, so we've gone over some pretty weird uh, neuromythologies, but always remember about a neuromythology, they always sound good and they always mean well. So they're, they always have beautiful words. They're very good at this type of thing. So maybe it's time to start looking at some good enough neuroscience about what's going on with revenge instead of just taking these neuromythologies, instead of taking consumers' opinions of it, instead of being confused by history about why was there so much revenge, let's, let's start looking at what's going on in the brain and, and figure out what the hell's going on here. So there's some pretty compelling evidence regarding social disconnection about uh, neural underpinnings and pain, physical and social pain, right? So they rely on opioid processes, both social and physical pain rely on op opioid processes. That's an interesting find. You would not think that social pain was affected by opioids. You would think social pain is a different part of the brain. It turns out it's not. You could say uh, the regions in which social exclusion have been shown to activate uh, the same way they would under physical pain as well. That's going to be your anterior um, uh, cingulate cortex, which we'll get to in great detail soon. There's some, let's see, what's this one? This is rejection from a romantic partner and bereavement also lead to activity in these same exact regions. So the, the physical pain, that part of the brain does light up under social, under social situations, on the social rejection and all these other things uh, that are typically usually, oh, social pain, just walk it off, you know? What are you doing? Um, you have neurocircuitry associated with physical and social pain, showing individuals who are more sensitive to one kind of pain are also more sensitive to the other. So if you got someone who's like hyper like sensory awareness or hyper sensory overload, uh, social pain is going to affect that person just as hard as the physical pain hits them. And most interestingly, next time you guys get rejected by a girl on Tinder, go pop a Tylenol. It'll work. Weirdest thing. So there is a linkage between physical and social pain. Now, the reason I bring up the social is because revenge is actually typically associated with saving face, i.e. a social damage has happened, right? So the, the physical pain and the social pain, if they are interlinked, then it makes sense why revenge is so fatal because it is just as equivalent as physical pain. The, the primary driver of it, the saving face is actually a, a physical pain event. All right, so in addition to that, let's go into what the, uh, the ventral lateral is up to. So people who are chronically aggressive, they are decoupling their brain's reward circuit and the inhibitory, uh, the ventral lateral during revenge. So uh, uh, what this basically means is when a person is engaged in revenge and they are very aggressive, um, it is... This is actually a bit of an opinion here. I don't know if I firmly agree with it, uh, but it's the idea that suppressing the rejection is actually a bad strategy. Uh, what it's doing, it's, it's fatiguing your inhibitory resources. So your, your ability to actually um, prevent the, inhibit, the inhibition, uh, in, inhibitory effect that would otherwise prevent additional aggressive behavior, if you, if you don't... If you don't um, if you are, how do I word this? 
if you are trying to pretend that the social pain isn't real, you will burn out your ability to contain your rage. That's basically what this is saying. And so we'll look at the dorsolateral. And now how does the brain suppress acts of revenge? It's not about creating revenge. What's, what about suppressing it? So this is a, this is a weird one. Um, I'll just read it as is. Uh, the team observed that a greater that the greater the dorsolateral activity during the pro provocation phase, the less participants punish the unfair player. On the contrary, low dorsolateral activity was associated with more pronounced revenge on the participant following pro provocation by the unfair player. So what's going on here is that um, usually the uh, the dorsolateral is associated. In this case, they're, they're making the case that the dorsal ladder was associated with vengeful behavior or not, uh, and that a direct correlation between brain activity known for emotional regu uh, regulation and behavioral choices. So this is a case where somebody could engage in revengeful activity, but here's the part of the brain that was responsible for suppressing it. So there are, there are in addition to uh, the red fury of rage that is associated with, with uh, the primary emotion behind revenge, there is also parts of your brain that will suppress it. And that's the, that's the major takeaway here. And that's at that neural chemical level. That's at the neural level, right? That's not a, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the brain that is actually doing some social choicing, uh, but it is there. It is, it is physically there. It's not a construct. It's not derivative of symbols. And so now we're talking about like some larger structures, but let's get down to the, let's get down to like the neurochemical level, right? Let's get down to specific neurochemicals that might be responsible for this. We're going to get down to oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is known as the love molecule, but it is very good at taking revenge and turning it into endless blood feuds. So you take Britney Spears and oxytocin, you get a blood feud. Now, if you know the history of that picture, you'll understand why I say blood feud. So we're going to go to oxytocin. We're going to start with oxytocin in females makes them less forgiving following a betrayal of trust. So when a female is very high up on the, on the love molecule and they're being under its influence, the subject showed less evidence for trust repair and the oxytocin compared with the placebo treatment. This suggests that oxytocin may make female subjects exhibit more punitive behavior towards partners who violate their trust and less sensitive to repair strategies provided by them. Now that is interesting. So if a trust violation happens by this experiment, it's saying that uh, this is primarily China. So keep that in mind. Uh, Chinese research is, if it's not stolen, it's always suspect. Um, but this is, this is I think this was repeated. It was reviewed, revised. I think a couple American universities uh, confirmed this as well. Uh, but in this case, the idea that uh, a trust violation happened in under oxytocin it was much more punitive. Now that's that's interesting because for a, one of the one of the grandest mysteries of of um, of neurochemistry in the female body for the longest time in the most absurd manner whatsoever was the female orgasm. It made no sense to a lot of people why it even existed um, because there's a tremendous amount of, of female animals who don't have the capacity for for that experience. And so its existence, I mean, you should see some of the just, you should see some of the explanations for the female existence, uh, for the female orgasm in uh, endocrine research and, and, um, and neurochemical research. They were coming up with off the wall, insane definitions and explanations that made no sense whatsoever. Until one guy actually put a little bit more brain power into it and found that oxytocin will actually physically move stuff that is in the vagina. It will physically move it by itself. So they were actually measuring um, uh, very small beads with all kinds of stuff, just literally planting them in there, adding the oxytocin, and it would just go whoop, like the womb had a sucking motion to it, like it was a tractor beam or something. Um, so here we are showing, the reason I bring this up, not just for novelty, uh, I'm bringing this up because it shows that oxytocin and the female birthing process uh, the female mating process. It's not just the love molecule. That's, that's just a, that's just like a little, the handy term that you use for it. It's showing that all these things are interrelated. 
if, if a female is not showing forgiveness for a betrayal of trust, and we know that oxytocin is it basically turns the womb into a sperm vacuum, uh, that, that betrayal of trust means I'm jumping to the next dude, fuck you. And that's just not a mood thing. That's a neurochemical thing. And so oxytocin is, this is the, that betrayal of trust is effectively a revenge behavior because you betrayed my trust. Fuck you. I'm, my, I'm the reward for someone else. You know, you're out, you lose. And then oxytocin associated with empathy and self-embarrassment. That's a weird one. Remember our dog that was embarrassed in the just world hypothesis? Well, oxytocin might've been to blame. So you have uh, significantly increasing ratings of both empathic and self-embarrassment, um, activation in the right amygdala and not the, pre, uh, the medial prefrontal. So the overall, let's see, our overall our results demonstrate that oxytocin increases ratings of self and other embarrassment and that this is associated with reduced physiological arousal and activity in neural circuits involving emotional arousal. So this is basically saying that when embarrassment uh, or see, or when oxytocin is going on, there is an embarrassment mechanism, but we know from the just world hypothesis that embarrassment was one of the potential explanations for devaluing another person. So how could that happen? Well, let's look at the part of the brain that they were examining in this particular research. It's called the anterior cingulate uh, cortex. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. So what it's, that's basically the cringe detector, that part of the brain. So if something is making you feel like oh man, this is like, oh like that, God, that person's embarrassing himself or oh, that person's just like being a victim unnecessarily or something, oh, this is like a social faux pas. That's what this is doing. That's what that part of the brain is doing. It's also where the largest density of these bad boys live. Now these are called spindle neurons. Now spindle neurons exist in us and certain like two different types of apes and nothing, and, and I think dolphins and elephants um, and nothing else. They don't exist in anywhere else in the animal kingdom. And if you have too many of them, you are a, you have a significantly enhanced increase of committing suicide if you have too many of these things. So embarrassment in this part of the brain and having too many of these associated with suicide, ugh, that's not a good mix at all. So oxytocin driving suicide, that's strange. It's a, it's a hop, skip and a jump. There's a lot of things that regulate in between uh, that kind of prevent that, but it is a known outcome. And if your choices are, I'm embarrassed for what I did, I'm going to kill myself, or I'm just going to devalue this guy harder, what do you think you're going to pick? So oxytocin promotes coordinated out-group attack during in-group in conflict in humans. Now, this is the damning piece. This is the part that, that is astounding. Uh, this is showing that when an out-group attacks an in-group, the victims of the in-group will be seen by other members of the in-group during their attack. They're going to get hit. They're going to get beat up. And so the other members of the in-group watch that. They empathize with the pain that their in-group is feeling. And from that empathy, they then go forth and conduct revenge actions. Empathy is driving revenge in this scenario in humans. That's crazy, but you've actually heard this phrase before. We've all heard this phrase before. You know, when my family's making fun of me, that's okay. But woe to anyone who, uh, you know, makes fun of my family, right? So you see that, that that's, a, that's a reason, that's a speech thing. So it's the, it's the empathy, the in-group empathy is actually a driver for the revenge. And this doesn't just appear in humans, by the way. This happens in chimpanzees too. In the wild, not even in a, not even in a lab, not in a zoo. Mm -mm. This happens in the wild. Of course, Hombrick, you know, he forgives all, bless his passing. But oxytocin is actually driving some of this serious revenge stuff, and not just the revenge rituals, but the blood feuds. It's when it's when the revenge ritual isn't enough. It's when the dispute between two people isn't enough. The oxytocin is what makes it go out of control. It's what makes it go contagious. And this is seen again and replicated in, in chimpanzees as well. And why stop at chimpanzees? Let's go to crows. Turns out under certain conditions, you can make crows conduct revenge too. 
And what they'll do is when they know they've been attacked, when they know they've been um, negatively impacted by a human, they will pass that knowledge on to their kids that that human is an attacker. You need to stay away from that. There's an ultra crow judgment on here. Uh, they would they would like honk at the they the person would put on a mask. They'd come in, um, they they basically just torment the crows, and the crows would recognize the mask as a signal for torment, and they would start like scolding. They would start calling at the person. They start flapping its wings at it. They would actually group up in in like a ball a murder of crows and swoop down and dive bomb the person. I mean that's that's pretty serious. That's that's a that's a very serious response, and then all that all that happening, they're also passing that information on to their spawn. So this is all these revenge activities. Uh, this is neurochemistry at work. This isn't just some moral defect going on here. This is multiple species demonstrating revenge behavior. And so, what's the summary? What's the summary of all this revenge stuff? Well, one, revenge rituals are universal. There is not a single culture that does not engage in a revenge ritual. Whether it's a duel, a voodoo doll, uh, katakichi, flower wars, the court system, those are all revenge rituals, and every single culture has one. No, there's no moral purity going on here. It's flight club all the way down. And revenge has a chilling effect. So revenge rituals were mostly kind of like taken over by Western legal systems. Um, and when that was done, that was done to reduce what was seen as a barbaric practice of dueling and everything like that. Uh, but no study was done to see how much violence the presence of an accessible revenge ritual prevented. Those studies were never done. So, for example, if, I, if I'm a dude and, and I'm, I'm about to get disrespected and I know that a duel is a possibility if I call him on that shit, am I going to call him on that shit? Because I don't want to I don't want to I kind of don't want this to escalate into not just death, but legally allowed death, right? And there's a difference between like pissing off the drunk at the bar because he might beat the shit out of me, but I think he's going to go to jail, so maybe he won't, versus this guy can legally challenge me to, to a fight to the death. So there is a chilling effect going on here, and it was not measured when, when revenge was outlawed. And this, this is true across almost all cultures. And revenge isn't homocentric. You know, you have elephants and Apes, crows, even fish engage in revenge behavior. Fish, the hell? Your sushi wants revenge, right? So th this isn't a human concept. So the, the philosophy about revenge literally doesn't matter. It's, it's almost nondescript at this point because other animals do it too. So oxytocin and empathy drive conflict uh, contagion. So it's basically a bunch of kids saying they're no bullies and, you know, they're doing the right thing because Disney told them. But what they're doing is conflict contagion. And we've, we've gone over that in the last slide. It's, it's the revenge ritual where by grouping up on someone to stop the revenge ritual is where you have an incentive for another group to come in and then an even bigger group and an even bigger group. And then you have a blood feud. And that's driven almost entirely by oxytocin. Banning revenge isn't working either. Uh, we may think uh, if we just ban harder and we outlaw revenge, and then all the revenge will go away because we're a punitive legislative culture. Uh, but it's just not true. Uh, if you replace a, a, a revenge ritual with a, with a very complicated abstraction of justice, uh, what you're doing is you're saying, in order to get any revenge, I need to hire a $2,000 an hour lawyer. What? No, that, the humans aren't going to play that game. What they're going to do instead is they're going to start coming up with some bootleg revenge rituals instead. So if I can't avoid that lawyer, I'm going to just dox your ass, and that's my revenge. I'm going to take screenshots of you. I'm going to get your IP. I'm going to find out what kind of porn you download on Torrent. You know, that's what I'm going to do. So people will do bootleg revenge rituals if courts get too expensive or too abstract or they just become too confusing because we're humans, and, and revenge is one of the most creative activities a human, a human being can do. And for, while it sounds like I'm singing praise to revenge rituals, they can be hacked. Someone can lie about a false dishonorment, which will then exploit a surplus male population. And then that male population will go out to try and restore the honor. And before you know it, they hack off a, a French teacher's head. And it was all just a hacked revenge ritual. That uh, dishonor didn't actually happen. Whoops. So revenge rituals can be exploited pretty aggressively. Um, and that's usually what leads to their downfall. 
Because on one hand, it is serving a purpose. It is doing a thing. On the other hand, man, you can exploit that shit all day. So, it, it, you know, exercise judgment if you want to go back to revenge rituals. Uh, that's my recommendation. So we've kind of like looked at all of these historical revenge, neurochemistry behind revenge, um, all the other factors that were going about it. What about you guys, right? Now, no one here has not felt the desire for revenge. I, I'm just, I'm making a statement and perhaps there's a Gandhi among us, right? But I'm, gonna, I'm, willing, to, I'm willing to bet that everyone here has felt the, the, the calling urge to, to give some comeuppance to, to a specific person. So here's some advice that you can do because we've seen all the traps about revenge in, in the last, in this presentation. We've seen uh, trying to ban revenge is kind of not going to work and expressing revenge in a weird way can cause kind of problems. And maybe the revenge you're feeling isn't instigated by you. Maybe someone made you feel that way and you didn't do your due diligence, right? So if you're going to feel this feeling and you literally cannot control this feeling, um, then perhaps you might want a checklist, a list of things you should probably ask yourself while you're going through this feeling. And uh, this is my personal checklist that I use. Uh, it helps me a lot because there's a lot of people who deserve it. So you, gotta, you can't be everywhere, right? You can't be everywhere all the damn time. You got to be very specific with who it is uh, will be the focal point of your rage. And the very first thing I says is it's, it's the reason for the revenge doesn't even make sense. Can I define it to myself in a way in which, yeah, this, this makes sense? Or is it just going to be like, oh, this, this fucking guy at McDonald's, he, he looked at me a weird way. That doesn't make sense. That's just, that's, that just disqualified, right? So it has to make sense to you, at least at the very minimum, and not you in a, in a rage scenario. And just like you in a, all right, is this real? Is this legitimate? You know, does it have a large number of sympathizers? We're getting into the scumbag shit now because the revenge you have isn't enough. It's if you want to do revenge right, you got to go find other people who can sympathize with it because you can, you can damn well bet that when you start going getting your revenge, they're going to call their sympathizers. So now you got to call yours. So you got to make sure that your reason for revenge is digestible to an audience. Eesh, that's kind of slimy, but this is revenge. Revenge is the most creative activity a human being can do. Has your revenge reason been a feature in mainstream news or entertainment tropes? Is it uh, Count of Monte Cristo, for example? Well, there you go. That's something that people can relate to. They've heard the concept before. So they have something to glab onto when they see the story. They see the, they see the action when they come across it. They go, oh, yeah, it's like that. So instead of having to you know, invent from a mythology from grand scratch, you know, your, your grand anti-hero scheme and arc here, and you just just reuse tropes that are known to take penetration and have have total pr proliferation. Are there people in history who have utilized your revenge reason? Because let's be honest, I mean, there's only so many ways you can probably trigger this revenge uh, impulse. Uh, have other people gone through this? How did it go for them? Did it go well? Why did they fail? Could they have done it better? What would you do knowing, you know, you do some critical analysis of, uh, of previous historical reasons? How many people have been affected by your revenge reason and are not vengeful? That's actually a pretty good uh, gut check. Because if, if you're out there getting like disrespected and you notice a bunch of other people got disrespected, but they're not hit as bad as you are, maybe it's you. Maybe you're the asshole, right? Maybe you're not. Maybe those people are drugged out and they don't even know how to do revenge. Maybe they're a bunch of American consumers who can't even do it right. So you got you to really get the context right. How powerful are the people who gave you a reason for revenge? This is probably an obvious one because if, uh, if a genuinely powerful person decided to step on your shoes, um, you may feel good, you know, yelling a curse word at him or voting against him or whatever the case may be. But if you do actual revenge against a powerful person who's unaccountable, woof, woof, those guys are slow. They get back to you, and then they get back to you in depth. So just be sure you understand the power level of the person that you're going after. Are the victims of your adversary routinely silenced, imprisoned, financially destroyed, or killed? That's probably a thing you want to know, too, because you want to understand just how far this person's willing to defend their honor for disrespecting your honor, and then it goes around, around, around. So these are all questions that are just designed to kind of like filter you down and say, do I really want to do this? Am I really ready to commit to this kind of stuff? 
Do the victims of your adversary routinely become drug addicts or commit suicide? That's an important factor too. Maybe this person doesn't hire Goombas to, to go after people. Maybe he, uh, he gets them hooked on heroin or maybe he, uh, I don't know, he just kind of exposes them to memes that make him want to kill himself or something like that. You never really know, but you, you want to understand the, the behavioral trend of other people who, are, who have walked in the path of vengeance and have failed. Just good due diligence. How many near peer adversaries have failed to bring down your adversary? Now you may think you're Superman in the moment of your rage, but if you're going against a billionaire, how many billionaires did that billionaire take out? Because none, none of y'all are billionaires. So what do you think you're gonna do, right? So you bet you need to understand this guy's success record. Can your adversary convince others to suddenly bolster their defense response? You go against a resource person, they make some phone calls. If they're really getting hit, if they're really just like backs to the ropes and they didn't expect this stuff, they will cut deals like you wouldn't believe. They'll pick up the phone and be like, look, I'll give you 70% of this asset if you, come to my, if you come to my rescue right now. And that is a sudden reinforcement that you can't prepare for. Oh, man, you're going to get wiped. It's just not going to go well for you. What are the vices, psychological shortcomings, behavioral preferences of your adversary? Important things to know. The more you understand the limitations of how they operate within their mind, the more you can understand how to control and predict their option tree. And this is, a, this is where a lot of your activity is going to take place. You're going to get intimate with this person. You're going to know this person better than their wife. And you're going to do so without empathizing with the person. Because if you empathize with the person, well, you're not going to do your revenge, are you? So you just studied this person. You might as well write their freaking autobiography at this point. No, you have to, you have to keep the empathy and the, and the research separate. What's the tolerance of complexity for your, aver- for your adversary? Everybody has a tolerance of complexity. And that tolerance of complexity is how many things you can track at any given time. So any revenge you conduct, you have to be outside of their tolerance for complexity. So if they can track like 100 things at a time, you want to make sure you're throwing 200 things at a time at them, because then they can't see where your real attack is. How good are you at hiding your intentions and evidence of your intentions? That's going to be important, because if you're conducting field work on the person, you're trying to figure out, oh, well, this person is a... he goes to a club, he goes to a social club, or he goes to a, a golf club or whatever, and you, and you want to get in, intermingle with the crowd and understand him. You, you can't just lash out the moment you see the guy. You can't just, oh, I'm going to get you, here go. No, you, you have to keep your disguise on. You have to do your field work. You have to understand the person, right? Have you practiced controlling your reactions to the adversary? That's really important to do because you can't just – this adversary is going to throw everything at you when you finally launch your attack. And if you don't understand your own reaction solution, oh, man, he's, and you're going to get goaded. You're going to make the wrong decision. You're going to go down the wrong pathway. You're going to, all your planning is going to go to shit. So you got to make sure you control your own reactions. Have you identified all the flaws of yourself that the adversary will exploit? This is slowly turning from revenge ritual into deep introspective analysis all of a sudden. This is a this is less of an act. This is less of an exercise of revenge, and it's more like a checklist of how to be aware of being alive. Almost, uh, these are these are all the things, all the flaws you have will be exploited. They will be found. You won't even know you have those flaws. So, a really deep introspection capacity is important for proper revenge. Can you utilize the resources of others without requiring their total commitment? It's very hard to raise adversaries who hate your rival as much as you do because they're out of the context. They don't care. They don't, they're not in it to win it like you are. So you got to be able to take their or utilize their resources in a way in which they don't need total commitment. They don't need to know the whole context. What's your threshold of trust that your adversary relies upon? That's going to be really important to hammer because you want to eliminate their ability to actually call in reinforcements, rely on friends, have network effects from their support structure, You have to understand what their thresholds of trust are, and you have to slowly snip each and every one of those connections. And then finally, have you dug enough graves before you begun? Because the old saying is that when you seek revenge, you must dig two graves, one for yourself and one for the target you're revenging against. It's always better to dig more than two. So if you are feeling the urge of revenge, and you suspect that the revenge rituals that are before you are unacceptable, and you suspect that the judicial system is not going to help you, and you suggest that, and you suspect that all your resources are currently not primed to, get to help you resolve this feeling you're having, 
this checklist will help you a lot. You can just go down by the numbers and answer each one of these every time you have a feeling of revenge, and you're going to see either the futility of revenge, or you're going to, if you reach the end of this and every answer makes sense to you, then you found something that's actually worthwhile, something that actually genuinely matters. And that it's not just you. It's not just your personal feelings. It's you have rationalized each and every one of these questions. You probably found something that everybody's pissed about. So this checklist is, a, is my candidate for a revenge ritual when everything else is failing you. And uh, that's it, the necessity of revenge. There it is, folks. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that, Pat. Um, so we have a lot of questions. Uh, instead of asking the first question, I will ask the last question. And we have um, about 20 minutes before we jump to, to the clubhouse. Uh, so I'll take in uh, Daniel, Cleo, Lubo. I don't know, you guys had a bunch of questions, so um, you'll be first. Hey, thanks again, Pat, for another wonderful session. Um, throughout it, I was thinking that if you combine this episode with all the other episodes of the Dark Stoa, and also some of the confusion I think that a lot of people have been feeling as a result of you know, 2020 and being locked up at home and all this stuff, it seems to come together in some interesting way where if we take away the moral piece of, of vengeance and we think about it as this fundamental drive that human beings have, and then you look at how fucked up everything is and how dark the world is. How can you combine all of that for the, the average person who's listening to this in a way that they can marshal their will, you know, and they can kind of put revenge as like another source of fuel behind their desire to be effective in the world. I know that checklist at the end is like one way to filter through that. And I asked my question before you got to that slide, but is there anything more you can say about that and how this connects to some of the other sessions in the Dark Stoa? Yeah, it does uh, quite a bit, in fact. Um, the, the impulse for revenge, because most of us are consumers, let's be honest, myself included, uh, we have a very poor frame for revenge. And so we're actually scared of the, of the topic itself. So this is designed to say, look, that feeling you have, there's some additional things behind it you should probably know. Um, and so here's what's going on in your brain. Here's what neuromythologies are kind of infecting your assessment. Um, here's the actual activities you should probably be looking at to do this correctly. Uh, I, am, I am a huge, huge advocate of this definition of revenge because it forces you to do a level of due diligence and self-honesty um, that almost all the other ones don't do. And so it's not just a question of you've, you've besmirched my honor, duels at dawn. It's not like that. Um, it's more like, all right, this is impacting me. How far am I willing to go? And this, that checklist forces you to go all the way. I mean, all the way up to and including your own death. Because it's easy to make those decisions in the heat of the moment. It's very interesting that people are willing to throw their lives away in the heat of the moment. That's probably, probably worth a, a study in and of itself. But this is the cold calculating way to do revenge, the way that the billionaires do it and the trillionaires do it. This is how they think about it. This is how they do it. So if you want to play for real, play for real. Um, but understand that trying to get through that checklist, 99% of the time, you're not going to be able to, which is a good thing because that's what the revenge ritual is supposed to do. It's supposed to prevent revenge from happening. So if you want to do it right, that checklist will get you there. Now, in terms of the darkness of, of 2020, uh, eh, it's an expectation thing. Media definitely had a role in a lot of that darkness. Uh, political situations did too. Uh, revenge was high and rife, but that was a that was one of those that was one of those uh, American consumer experiences of revenge, right? It's all a fun ride. Uh, woe to the poor souls who actually died during the the very worst of the heat of it. However. Uh, everybody was properly placated. They were supposed to be, and they were. So I, I suspect that uh, the revenge motifs of 2020 were designed to isolate, confuse, and most importantly, keep people from actually doing revenge. And I would say it was a wild, wild success. Any follow-up, Daniel? Yeah, um, 
actually, I'll give it to Khalil for the follow-up question. Um, I guess one of the things that came to mind was um, it might be kind of difficult to prevent revenge slippage. So if someone wrongs you and that person is not accessible, you might transfer the wrong to a generalized category. For example, my friend, he got jumped by a homeless person and he was very ashamed and embarrassed that he didn't have the fighting instinct to, to, to fight the person off. He just didn't have it in him. And then he agonized about that for like a year. And then he told me the next homeless person that tries that, I'm gonna just kick the shit out of them and pretty much cripple them. <sighs> it, it, it's, it's pretty uh, dark stuff, but um, it, it, the revenge kind of slipped there or like a horizontal or trickle down revenge or something. I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, yeah, so that's, um, that's a very good point. Um, this is what happens when the revenge ritual isn't satisfied. Um, when the person who has wronged you cannot be accounted for or cannot be brought to some um, uh, bearance of their actions, um, and then what you're calling slippage uh, tends to happen. You, know, you will lash out at a generalization. Notice he said to the next homeless person, like the problem was homeless people, right? Um, that, that, that's, that's, that's just the easiest generalization he could, make, he could attach to and find at that moment. Um, so it's, it's uh, but again, this is the revenge impulses and generalization tend to group together because, and again, this goes back to in-group, out-group. You, you go to Japan with those warring periods, all those daimyos and samurai, they were all relatives. They were all related. So in-group and out-group, you could generalize your vengeance from most of history. Because it was the McCall, it was the McCoys who went after me. No, it was the it was this family that went after me. It was that family that went after me. So generalization and revenge actually gets a pretty good evolutionary reward because uh, you're able to identify that this family and this tribe is a threat, and they may be infiltrating. So that generalization is actually, you know, that helps revenge in those terms, in those contexts when you, when human beings are sparse. Uh, but when you have human beings in cities and they're packed all over the place, that generalization just turns into a shit show. You just you're, you're you're blaming the wrong person all the time, and then you're incentivized to blame the wrong person. So um, you can you can very well make sure that people are definitely definitely taking advantage of that. So in terms of reducing the slippage, that's what the revenge ritual is for. The revenge ritual is supposed to reduce the slippage. Thanks. I also have a general question. I think some of us have a general question about internalized revenge and how that relates to suicide. But I'll, I, I want to open up to other people, and maybe you can tie that in to someone else's question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that might tie into the next question. Actually, uh, Hannah, you had a question about incels. Yeah, uh, Pat, if I mentioned the Toronto van attack, are you familiar with that? The Toronto ban attack? Van. van no, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so uh, a guy, I guess, had been very angry at how many people had refused his offers to go on dates and things like that. And it's been called an incel, of course. And uh, he ended up getting very angry and renting a van in a overtime sort of way that indicated premeditation and running over approximately a dozen people in Toronto, most of whom women. And I'm thinking, you know, if we're able to view this through the lens that you've given us tonight, how can we prevent that sort of thing from happening in the future? See, that's, that's, that's part, of the, part of the challenge is that prevention. The idea of it's, it's preventing the revenge ritual that I suppose is causing these attacks. It's causing these events to happen. Um, as we've seen with uh, social rejection, rejection can cause physical pain. And that physical, it's not that the physical pain is a, a rationalization. What I'm saying is the physical pain will be perceived as a threat, right? So if the social and the physical pain are real, if they're sharing the same bands, then it is very easy to mistake it as a threat, even though it may not be an immediate threat. Um, so by, on one hand, yes, uh, social rejection. Yeah, we're not going. Oops, oh, sorry. sorry. That's okay. Uh, so social rejection, um, that's a that's a very complicated subject in and of itself. There's a lot of factors that drive and and that that make social rejection happen. Don't make social rejection happen. In terms of preventing that attack, uh, 
if that, uh, uh, I would, you know, I'm, I'm really putting a lot of faith in, in the revenge ritual on this one because social rejection happens, you know, throughout all of history. Uh, a, a suitor goes to a potential uh, bride and asks for a hand in marriage and, you know, gets slapped down, laughed down or whatever. That happens. You know, there's plenty and plenty of stuff throughout antiquity where that's the story. But those small tribes of small communities and towns, uh, they had ways of dealing with these problems. It didn't result in these vengeful attacks against generalized populations. It's this transference. It's the transference of the aggressor that is causing a lot of these issues. Um, because let's face it, the Italian mafia doesn't go around whacking random people and blowing them up. Uh, they shoot the specific people who are responsible for the sleight of hand. They're not doing drive-bys and you know shooting everybody. So the people who have uh, the desire for this revenge ritual that's not given to them, um, they will do this transference stuff. And so my, my recommendation is to give them the revenge ritual, give something to them that can actually, if they're going to transfer anyway, right? They're already making a transference. Well, let's just virtualize the transference. You know, here's the revenge ritual. Go ahead and do it. This is going to help. And if it doesn't help, well, we got some other stuff to do. And, you know, it, the problem with prevention is that it requires detection. And detection is hard. That's crazy hard. I mean, you'd have to monitor like all Facebook all the time to find uh, 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 detection. Um, uh, I, it, a lot of my answers are probably, when it comes to atrocities like that, my answer is probably mostly going to be we need revenge rituals in some capacity or another, especially for people who are already demonstrating transference as, as one of their solutions. So something like a, a revenge ritual that's going to either be more specific to the person who hurt you or be less damaging to society at large? Yeah, you would be surprised how far life can, how far a revenge ritual is satiated. If you take a punching bag, you put a person's face in that punching bag who wronged you and you're just training on that, uh, you'll be surprised how much that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh all right, Evan, I'll take you in next. All right, let me go back to my question. So, um, so Pat, it seems like the whole Dark Stoic series seems to be at least in part chronicling this sort of accelerating story of human domestication. So I'm curious if you see it this way, and if so, do you see this as something that can be resisted on the level of the individual or the small group? And if so, what would your best suggestions for doing so be? Domestication. Uh... The industrial society and its ram. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but the uh, um, um, domestication is a very large topic. Uh, a lot of domestication is kind of willful. I know it's sad to say that because uh, there's plenty of examples where it's forced at gunpoint and sword point. But that's not domestication. That's kind of like breaking a generation and then getting their kids to be domesticated. Um, uh, domestication is one of those self-renewing contracts. It's like, I'm domesticated, so I'm engaging in this virtualized definition of community. Here's some money, here's some trade, here's some this, here's some that. And it's one of those good enough solutions. Resisting uh, re a revenge ritual is technically domestication too, right? So it's the idea of like, okay, look, you guys are, you guys got some primal fucking neurochemistry going on here. Got to channel it, right? We got to channel it. You can deny what you can, but we got to channel it. It's got to go somewhere productive. And uh, revenge is also when you see a duel, it's rare. Rarely do you see duels where it's just two dudes shooting guns at each other. It's like two dudes, they're friends, some passerbys, the dude with the camera for World Star. You know, they're all watching this shit. And so it's like this social experience. It's, it's training saying, look, this revenge went down. I was here. I was witness to this revenge being finished. This revenge is done, right? The idea of a revenge being done is alien to American audiences. There's no such thing. The revenge is never done in American consumer land. It's eternal. Yeah. <laughs> R.I.P. Biggie, right? <laughs> so, so domestication and revenge ritual are actually hand in hand. A revenge ritual is not going to uh, undomesticate people. Um, it's going to kind of sink them further into that. And my advocacy of it is um, 
is more or less not a hat tip to domestication as much as it's a chance to buy time, a little bit more time in order for me to get what I need done. So it's pretty self-serving for me. <laughs> Quick follow-up. Um, what would you say is the best way to set up an effective revenge ritual against a bureaucratic foe? Yes, that is, that is a fantastic question. Well, elections are out. That should be obvious. Um, so if, if, uh, if that's out, I would, uh, the thing about a bureaucracy is that in order to fight a foe on terrain, they master, you have to actually kind of get to know the terrain a little bit better. Uh, you're not going to will victory just by, you know, out of sheer hatred and, and force of will. Um, you actually have to understand bureaucracy. How is it working? What is going on? Who is this person dependent upon? Who is the primary funder? Uh, what bills has this person passed? Where do they stand? What cocktail party? I mean, this is just straight due diligence. This is what lobbyists do all day. So you have to actually sit down, do the homework, don't trust the crowds, because if you do the homework, you don't need the crowds. You don't need a fucking democracy to get revenge on a bureaucratic foe. All you need to do is research the person, and in the process of researching it, you're going to find that person's natural enemy, and you take all your research, and you sell it to that person, and that person will destroy your bureaucratic foe. So there. Cool. All right. So uh, we'll take in Kim and then, uh, then I'll ask my question. Kim, you're up next. There we go. Hi. Um, so I'm fascinated by this whole idea of the um, kind of the evolution of revenge. And I, it makes me think about Christianity's concept of forgiveness that came in. Um, and so, you know, the whole thing of remove the beam out of my eye and then I can start to even see the speck in my brother's eye. So how do you, is this, is, is forgiveness from Christianity in your viewpoint, possibly a, a revenge ritual process? It would be the final uh, revenge ritual, in fact. Um, what uh, the, the death of Christ is one of those final revenge rituals. It's the end. A revenge ritual ends the revenge, right? So if if you have a son of a god dying uh, and saying, "I am the final sacrifice," uh, then all revenge cycles end. So yes, th that would be peak apex revenge ritual. However, uh, the messages get distorted because of nominal reasons and whatever, whatever. Um, but also keep in mind that the Bronze Age isn't necessarily known for its duels. It's an interesting thing. You don't, you don't hear a lot of duels during the Bronze Age in which Christianity kind of comes around in at the very late, uh, late, uh, late end of it. So uh, re revenge is usually relegated to the realms of unaccountable kings and lords and emperors of the Bronze Age. Mostly. They actually have a monopoly on it for the most part. Um, individual petty squabbles are dealt with. Uh, but this is not really the full-blown, the Romans are coming, run for your life type of revenge. Um, you, you see, I mean, you see that happen to Israel or Judea at the time pretty ruthlessly. The revenge that the Romans excluded on them lasted 2,000 years. Uh, so that's the level of revenge that was possible, that was um, available to uh, Bronze Age powers at that time, where they can displace an entire population for literally two millennia. So um, if those are the stakes... And that's the type of revenge ritual that's going on. You're probably going to need something like the death of the son of a god to kind of counterbalance against that. Yeah, and then also, what what, what must what type of thinking or perspective must die in me to let go of the distraction of revenge? Not uh, bad nor good. It's just a, it's a distraction possibly um, um, proposition here that could be a distraction to um, a mission, a purpose, or whatever you want to call it. And, and again, not good, bad, or holy, higher, or lower, just it seems to be, my experience of it is, is almost a distraction to my mission. Sure. Um, in terms of distraction, uh, I, I go back to uh, Revenge's Mind said the Lord to overcome evil with good is to overcome. It doesn't say uh, classify this as a distraction and pretend you don't have to deal with it. You still have to overcome the evil. Oh, you're muted, sorry. 
any uh, uh, quick follow-up, Kim? We're going to close soon. No, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great conversation. All right. So we're going to close soon. Uh, I'll ask the last question. Um, when you proposed this session, Pat, you said this would be a nice little bow on the Dark Stoa series, uh, the 17 previous episodes. And considering the trajectory of the series and perhaps maybe getting a little personal, um, what does revenge mean to you? I've spent a good chunk of my life dedicated to revenge. One of my favorite heroes, favorite heroes of, of all the superheroes is a not superheroes, the Punisher. Love, love the concept of that character. He's not rich, doesn't have superpowers. He's just a singular force of will who just annihilates. It's, it is, it's actually kind of this refreshing thing because you hear superheroes and they're like, ah, well, you know, I'm not born special, so I guess I can't do it. And here's Frank Castle sitting down with, a, with his family taken from him. And he's like, no, nah, I'll go to any length, any length whatsoever. I don't even need money. I'll just take money from the people I'm, you know, I'm punishing. So it's just, this is, that's the level that you have to play at if you want to do revenge correctly, because it's not enough to do revenge against the person who has faulted you. That's not enough because what you're doing is let's say you're going after a pedophile for what he did to you or your brothers when you were five years old and you decide, okay, I'm going after this person, but that's not enough. Because let's say you watch these children and you see them get older and you see them do drugs and you see them commit suicide and you see them get no revenge whatsoever. And so you have to understand you're up against an incentive system. You're not up against a person. You're not up against a monster. You're up against a system of incentives that made this monster possible. If you do revenge right, you take out the system of incentives. You're not taking out people. You're not taking out individual monsters. You're not hunting. You are taking that system of incentive and saying, this is now defunct. You're not doing this anymore. So revenge to me is, has been very long time coming and very, very rewarding. So you feel like you received uh, revenge? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely got it. Cool. So uh, on that note, uh, we'll conclude the Dark Stoa series. Uh, I will hand it over to you, Pat, for any final words you'd like to leave us with. Well, uh, Peter, thank you for taking the risk on this one. I, I know I my flippant conversation and affiliations are always the damage and out of everyone you've consistently taken the risk we've had the conversations about how to do it and for that uh please show peter any type of respect he needs or any type of vengeance he needs done just just please someone in the audience give it to him um, uh, but for everyone else um, dark stoa has been a chance to take what's in my mind uh, which has been very singular and very isolated for a long time and have the ability to work it out, word it out, uh, set premonition, execute upon, and achieve the tiny little thing I cared about um, in its own little way. The blackmail inflation thing was just like this deeply encoded weapon that was just sitting there for a long time, just waiting to be activated. And it was. And, uh, well, that's what revenge looks like. Well, um... Uh, from my end, it's been fun getting kind of sucked into your <laughs> existential <laughs> <laughs> drama. Um, and yeah, I'm going to miss, uh, you know, these uh, Dark Stoa sessions. I'm going to miss you and sending you lots of love from uh, myself and the Stoa. And uh, yeah, so that concludes the Dark Stoa at the Stoa. Um, but it's not completely over yet because we're going to have a post sense making kind of party thing and we're going to clout chase on <laughs> on the clubhouse so uh i'll close off here and then we'll see everyone in uh, a moment on clubhouse if you can make it so that being said pat everyone thanks for coming to the store today <laughs>